so uh, kind of the, the context around this could go on for 20 minutes alone, so I'll, I'll just kind of keep it short. Um, any discussion of uh, you know, liquid fuels for automobiles or for transportation, really you have to think about fuel efficiency, so we're not gonna do that, but that's, you know, one of the first things to think about. Uh, you know, be as efficient as we can. It's kind of, most people agree that liquid fuels are gonna remain important for transportation for quite some time to come. So there's an interesting, you know, question you can think about is where will fuels come from? And uh, in the US there's a really interesting combination of energy, economics, and uh, environment because the U.S. uses a disproportionately large amount of uh, crude oil for transportation. Uh, we actually produce quite a bit. There's also opportunity to produce more in the United States, although most of our fields are old and sort of broken down, so we have to think about things to do that. And environmentally as well, uh, we actually have some of the strictest environmental regulations you know, in the world, and if you want to think about actually doing things in an environmentally sort of good way, doing them, you know, producing energy in the U.S. makes some sense. So uh, a little known fact is that a, a little over 1%, so this is a non-negligible amount of natural gas consumed in the United States, is actually burned in oil fields uh, in order to make steam, and that steam is injected to um, displace uh, oil and to, to produce it. And there's a little thing here that, that to think about as we go through, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this. If you think about renewable energy technologies, how do they fit into all this fossil fuel stuff that I just talked about? Uh, they're really sort of land area intensive. And if you think about where do I want to build a really big, uh, so sort of like thousand megawatt power plant, you know, that runs off of renewable energy. Where can I do that? Um, you know, places on the planet that are not sort of pristine might be the places you want to do that. And that's kind of what oil fields are. They're not pristine at all. So why would you want to heat up oil? Uh, this is a plot of uh, just a viscosity versus temperature. And uh, this is a funny sort of shorthand that petroleum engineers use, but a, a 10 degree API oil is in fact is as dense as water. So if we look at this guy at about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, it's about 100,000 uh, centipoys. And if I heat it up to about 300 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, its, it's viscosity is now in the tens of centipoys. So heating up, this oil has reduced its viscosity by orders of magnitude. So if you want a, 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 a similar way of thinking about this, you could think about honey, right? If you have honey in the refrigerator, um, it's very cold, it's very thick, it's very viscous. You take that same honey and you put it on the end of the spoon and you put it into a, a cup of boiling water, right, to sweeten your tea, and the honey becomes, you know, very inviscid, flows very easily. Oil has much the same, much the same effect. So heating it up, it's easier to, to move it. Uh, how do we actually generate steam today? Uh, is indicated on this diagram. So you would have uh, a natural gas stream, a water stream. It would go into a so-called cogeneration plant. So the first thing that they would do is actually generate electricity. From the waste heat from the generated electricity, they would generate steam. So this cogeneration plant makes electricity for power sales, and then it makes steam that goes to the oil field that produces uh, oil. You know, there's a whole lot of water recycled. This is actually an interesting oil field uh, because they make electricity, they make uh, oil. They also make water that's sufficiently clean that they sell it for uh, irrigation. Okay, so that's kind of the way it's done today. I want to tell you about, you know, perhaps a different way of doing this, and I'll, I'll highlight, you know, some of the ways <clears throat> that it uh, could be significant. And uh, these are the, the people who have worked on this, what you see today, although I see Mac over there, he's worked on parts of this uh, idea. So the kind of the main conclusions are, are this. So uh, if you are injecting steam for oil recovery, you want to just set a rate and you want to inject it because it's easy to do. Um, if you're going to substitute solar steam for natural gas steam, it seems pretty 
obvious to think about using steam during the day, right, when you have good sunlight and cutting it back at night. So from the reservoir perspective, uh, turning steam up and down uh, works the same way as injecting steam continuously. And that's actually an important message for uh, the engineering part of it. The, and I'll, I'll, as I go through the little bit of the economic analysis, the interesting thing is that from a project-wide sort of perspective, the economics are, are pretty good. So high solar fraction refers to an idea that you're going to blend natural gas steam and solar generated steam, right? So having, you know, a large fraction of your steam come from solar is, is economic. Uh, and then, you know, if you take and look at all of the, the CO2, you know, that might be generated uh, by, by doing this in a, in a solar sort of way, it turns out to be pretty good from a CO2 emissions point of view. So here is just uh, sort of a, a little bit of a quirky diagram of, you know, how this could work. So you have a, uh, a concentrating solar power plant that captures solar energy, concentrates it. You use that heat to generate steam, okay? This is tied in with a, a gas-fired steam generator, um, and then this is injected into an oil reservoir, and uh, through sort of careful design, right, we enhance the oil production, and, uh, you know, hopefully more oil kind of comes out. So, you know, where could you do this? You, this is a map of the concentrating solar resource in the United States. So red is better, you know, greater uh, average uh, solar insulation. Here is the Central Valley of California. There are significant oil fields here in California in this southern end of the, of the valley. So it's not, you know, in this prime spot like you'd see in the Mojave Desert, but it's, it's still pretty good. So we have good solar resource. We have oil reservoirs um, that, might, that might benefit. So this uh, next couple slides are just to show you that actually some of these devices actually uh, do exist. So this is in a, a little uh, demonstration facility uh, near Bakersfield. So these are, here are parabolic troughs, okay? Uh, here actually is, a, so this one is actually uh, concentrating, and you can see here is the, where the heat is collected. So this is actually shining white because all of the insulation's been put back up there. This is an interesting facility uh, because the idea here was they wanted, because they want to build many, many mirrors, they want to make mirrors as cheaply as they can. So these, these mirrors are super light. Uh, the problem if you put something super light out right in the wind, it blows around and it gets dirty. So this is actually inside of a repurposed greenhouse uh, that keeps the, keeps the dust off and, uh, and actually keeps, keeps it from, uh, you know, from the wind from blowing everything around. Here's another one. This is also in California near Coalinga. So this is a little more conventional. So these are all mirrors here. They're shining uh, up onto here. And uh, this is commonly referred to as a, uh, as a power tower, okay? So, um, you know, these, these devices do exist, okay? And that's also sort of what's sort of giving this, you know, growing interest in this stuff. So we did really a, a, a viability study, right? So what happens in the reservoir? Do the economics make sense? What about the environmental impacts? And this is all in the context of the San Joaquin Valley. So the, the sort of the bottom line in terms of performance is to look at scenarios like this. So this is injection rate in green is kind of what they would do today. They would set a rate and be constant. The blue is what sort of something dairy, daily variability is going to look like. There's also seasonal variability, right? So the intensity um, is low in the winter, peaks in the summer, and then um, goes down again in the winter. So basically, you know, we've built a model of what injection rate would look like through the years. There is another model existing in the literature for what you know an oil reservoir would look like. And so that's been sort of implemented. In terms of the economics, um, basically, you know, use sort of literature data and figure out, you know, different 
systems. So the solar thermal plant is in fact capital intensive. It's sort of this line on the top, right? So it's going to be very expensive in terms of capital, but the fuel is free. And we did an interesting thing as well, is that instead of using a projection four, we actually use historical data. So I'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit when we get there. And then from the sort of environmental impact, the main thing we were concerned about were CO2 emissions. So we did a uh, sort of a life cycle assessment. So here you, you, know, you need to count all the energy that's gone into the glass. This has got a concrete uh, foundation, so all the energy into the concrete. The mirrors are actually made in uh, Shenzhen, China, so you've got to get them from China to Bakersfield, so you need to figure that. Um, that CO2 amount out, and uh, and and basically just kind of you know do the accounting and sort of put it all together. So here is you know a a, a, a quick sort of summary of what the the modeling looks like. So this is a section of the Earth, and what you're actually looking at is temperature. So red is high temperature, blue is low temperature. Here is an injector. Here there's some geology that's not really indicated. There are there are some shales that are here that make the distribution of steam a little more difficult. But what we find out is that um, this cyclic injection of steam um, leads to the same sort of temperature profile that we get if we had continuous injection of steam. This is well heated. It looks it looks pretty good. Um, the real sort of you know, proof, if you will, is how does it produce oil? So uh, what you see going up, peaking, and coming down is actually the oil rate. So green is that constant rate injection. Blue is the variable. This is the cumulative amount of oil produced. So you can see this produces oil, and then it's sort of done after uh, you know after about 700 days. But you know, they're not exactly the same. There are differences, but you know, in terms of how this is performing, it's it's virtually the same, right? Um, the the peak rates are the same. They're only slightly displaced a little bit. There's an interesting sort of story about sensitivity to some things that I'll just skip, and uh, and just kind of go to the summary here. So what what it kind of says uh, is that if you think about the traditional sort of benchmarks that the engineers worry about, which is what's that peak rate, when is the steam going to break through to a production well, you know, the reservoir doesn't care if you just put all the steam in at a constant rate or if you cycle it up and down and, and uh, chase the sun, which is, which is a good thing. Um, there are, you know, some details about heat losses that are, that are kind of geeky and, and interesting nevertheless, but I won't, uh, I won't sort of go into them. So uh, in terms of the economics, um, you know, we could have sort of projected forward. Uh, but what we did is we said, well, there's good historical data. I showed you that flow diagram for how they generate steam at Kern River. Um, so Kern River has been undergoing steam injection since about 1980. So there's historical data there. So we don't actually have to go back and make any projections about how it would behave. We can go back and we know exactly how much steam they injected. We know exactly how much oil was produced. We know exactly what the cost of natural gas was. We know exactly what they could sell electricity for. So there's there's very little sort of what ifs that, uh, that kind of go into this. There's an interesting thing to kind of point out here too is if you look at this is the steam they injected and this is the oil they produced. Later in the life they cut way back on steam and they're producing about the same amount of oil. So this is actually overbuilt, overinjected, but in our in our analysis, even though it's capital intensive, we say, okay, we're just going to build the solar power plants and, uh, and to provide that and uh, not do any sort of optimization because this is historically what happened. So uh, engineers uh, are not very good at uh, economics. We like to do one you know one number that makes sense. So this is net present value. So the net present value is if you take the life of the project right and you bring it all back, you know, you figure out all of the revenue that you'd make, all of the expenses that you'd put into it, and you can take it back and project it into, you know, what would it be worth today. So this is net present value versus a bunch of scenarios. So this is just burning natural gas to make steam. This is that cogeneration case. This is what it would be if you used all solar energy. 
And the different colors are actually different sort of discount rates. So at a 5% discount rate, the cases that do the best here are actually solar cases. So this says all of your steam comes from solar, half, and 25% comes from solar. So similarly, if you use a sl slightly greater discount rate, they're all sort of knocked down, but you know they're all behaving more or less kind of the same, and, and the solar cases you know hang in there economically, you know based on this sort of a this sort of case that you saw. So. Um, you know, kind of the summary here is that even though all of those solar scenarios have very high capital expenses, um, when you take that capital expense and you figure it out over a 30-year lifetime, it ends up being quite a, quite a competitive um, project. Okay, and you know there's lots of sort of optimization that somebody could do in there um, because the economics are very sensitive to uh, to natural gas price and things like this. So I'm running a little short on time. I'll just maybe cut to this here. So if you think about so one of the problems with thermal recovery and one of the problems with sort of these um, unconventional resources is that it takes a lot of energy to get them out of the ground. This is the problem with the tar sands in Canada. Um, this, this is an issue. So one of the sort of the benchmarks that people like to do is they like to compare um, how much CO2 does it take um, to produce a unit of, this is gasoline before you've added uh, ethanol to it. Um, how much you know, energy does it take? So the benchmark here is sort of conventional crude oil. Okay, So California thermal, the way it does today, you know, this number is about 90. And uh, if you do it kind of today, it's about 120 grams of CO2 per megajoule of gasoline. Okay, you see still that most of the energy, most of the CO2 is associated actually combustion of the um, of the gasoline. But you know, if you have this these solar thermal cases, um, the the numbers end up being quite similar to sort of conventional crude oil. So there is a pathway to sort of reduce the carbon intensity of. Uh, of producing these sort of unconventional fuels. Okay, so that's a summary of that. The uh, turns out that in this, all of this accounting for embodied energy, the thing that has the most sort of embodied energy is the glass. Okay, so it takes a lot of energy to make glass, um, but nevertheless, you know, it turns out being you know quite uh, quite reasonable from a CO2 emissions perspective. So sort of, you know, kind of the, the takeaways are uh, there's sort of lots of limitations about, you know, the analysis that's done. Um, and there's lots of things to think about. But the, the story looks pretty good so far. And, you know, there's about a 24% reduction in CO2 emissions. Okay. And you could say, you know, what, what fraction of... Uh, cogeneration, what I need to get about that same because they take an emissions credit for cogeneration because they make electricity. And it's about 20%. So even, you know, a regular case where you generate steam during the day by sun and then generate steam overnight using natural gas but keep a constant rate would be about 33%. So it's still uh, perhaps worth thinking about solar steam. Uh, when you sort of add all the numbers up. So I'll stop there um, and uh, see about questions. Sure. Yeah, I was wondering, how does um, the steam-based EOR, how does that compare with uh, um, like CO2-based EOR as far as reservoir production goes? Oh, um, so I guess there's there's a couple of answers, right? So at the moment, uh, if you talk about production in the U.S., about half of the enhanced recovery comes from steam, about half comes from CO2. Historically, if you add up all the cumulatives, much more of our enhanced recovery has come from steam. Um, there's there's been a, a gradual shift as more CO2 has been available uh, to do more CO2 EOR. And it's interesting. Some people will say, oh. You know, th there's a competition, right? But in terms of the reservoirs that are, are good for CO2 are probably not reservoirs that are good for steam. So there's a different class of reservoirs that are being accessed by steam and a different class that are being accessed by CO2. 
Okay, so so uh, I'll I'll come back to that. The f the first thing, though, if you think about uh, at least in California, right? They've already built and purchased all of that natural gas fired steam generation. So they wouldn't. So you wouldn't. You know, that's economics. That's that's money that somebody's already invested, right? So uh, we don't have to worry about that here. If you built a new facility, right, you'd have to worry about that. Yeah. Uh, in terms of how that. So if you if you think about this, I'm going to have a, I'm going to have a very strict solar regimen, right? I'm going to generate steam eight hours a day, and then I'm going to just dribble in a little bit of heat to keep the wells working overnight, and then I'm going to cycle it up during the day. So the reservoir is a big, huge buffer. Um, it takes all of those cycles and it just kind of spreads them out, um, and, and uh, the the Production is a little bit different, um, but if you wanted it to behave exactly the same, then then there are some ways to make it behave exactly the same. Um, you you base well, you have to basically drive the reservoir a little bit differently than the way people do. But but the, yeah, the message is the reservoir is a big, huge buffer. Um, you can cycle up and down, but in terms of you know when things actually are coming out, it it tends to dampen everything out and just smooth it out. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you, you showed a slide about sensitivity to different discount rates. I was also curious if there have been analyses that potentially take into account um, because it's more capital intensive. If it, uh, there have been other analyses that take into account shocks on um, on uh, capital expenditures. So if, for example, um, th there was some random or stochastic shock on infrastructure, uh, how would that affect uh, long-term profitability versus other? Um, Forms of generation that aren't as capital intensive. Yeah, so you know, definitely our analysis was pretty simple, um, and as far as I know, most other people's analysis have been pretty simple. I mean, I think you bring up a good point, right? So if you say, I'm going to build a thousand acres of greenhouse, which wouldn't be unreasonable um, if this really takes off, right? But the price of glass for greenhouses is going to do so, it's not going to be what it currently is, right? But yeah, we haven't thought about that. But that's a, I think that's a that's sort of you know a next step to start thinking about in terms of economics. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming the reservoir does such a great job of buffering because the fact we've been conducting some time scales are such that the diurnal time scale is an effect. Do you see any seasonal effects with changes in, in Solar insulation over seasonal time scales. Um, yeah, so that's right. So the reservoir is, is really good at, at diffusing heat, right? So you have to heat the rock up, and that's a diffuse mechanism, as well as you have to just push all of that material out. Um, so this is part of the interesting story: is uh, we can see, we can. I mean, it's not a big fluctuation, but you do see that. Uh, as I said, as, actually, actually, as we saw a little bit there, production does lag a little bit with the solar cases, and you know if that's uh, an issue, the this is part of the sensitivity that I didn't show, is that what you do is you sort of drive the reservoir harder. So now there's questions about can you drive it harder, and it, and it sort of opens up a whole set, other set of questions. But basically, what you do is during the summer you you push harder, so you inject at higher pressure, and you get more heat in because it's really it's a matter of heat in oil out. So if you get the same amount of heat in over a year, you'll get virtually the same amount of oil out. Um, and that, that's ba So that's the problem is in the winter, right? The amount of heat you're putting in is less. And if you have these sort of more conventional constraints about how you drive the reservoir, then you don't meet your heat targets. Um, but yeah, but, it, but more or less, if you put the, the same amount of heat in continuously or variably, you get virtually the same amount of oil out. 
Yeah. Uh huh. So, um, in terms of ultimate recovery, driving it harder seasonally and then driving it uh, less hard during the winter, will that influence your ultimate recovery from that well substantially? Um, no. It well. So as long as you don't. So there's an issue like like anything, right? You could break the reservoir, um, and if you break the reservoir then it's, you know, then you've got some problems. Um, but we sort of know what to do, right? And we know how to study the problem. So so as long as you're not, you know, breaking the system, yeah, it, it, it's not really going to matter. There's an interesting thing here, too, that in terms of production and economics that people haven't really thought about either. Um, one of the reasons that you shut down a conventional EOR project uh, is that the um, expenses to say buy natural gas start to get, you know, into your profit margin, right? So the amount of, you know, money that you're expending for your operating expenses is approaching your um, revenues. The interesting thing about these solar plants, right, is that the the, the, most of the costs are all sort of fixed up front. So there's been a whole set of discussions and it haven't really resulted in research yet. But if you think about the end of the life of a project, um, if the steam is essentially free, um, you might actually do something a lot differently than the way that people do it today. So you might drive it very, very hard. Um, and, and, you know, if you you know, again, try not to break the reservoir, but um, you might do things very differently than the way that they're that they're done here. Mm -hmm. Does this technology have other uh, sort of fossil applications? Could you use this uh, with tar sand, as you suggested, or even in like coal seams to extract energy? Okay, so the uh, the so if the if you think about the Canadian tar sands, uh, you're going to have a problem with insulation, right? Um, and the issue ends up being not that you can't do it, but that you need, so the amount of area that you need is geographically determined. So if you want to do this in tar sands, you need a much larger, you know, much larger area um, because the insulation is less. Um, so, so, yeah, you have to be careful. Although you think about Venezuela, which has some political issues, but has certainly um, an oil resource that's similar to Canada. Um, it has some sort of potential there. Where, what I think is interesting about this technology, I sort of alluded to this in the beginning, is if you think about, you know, we need to build an infrastructure to generate electricity renewably. I mean, we have, at some point, we have to do that, right? Um, it's going to be either sooner or later. Uh, there are pretty significant, you know, issues that people have about, you know, taking the Mojave Desert and paving it over with solar collectors, right? Um, in terms of where this can come in is, you know, oil fields are large areas. They're, you know, there are generally in remote places, but they are industrialized, right? So the alternate sort of technology for this is that as the fields are sort of done, um, what you do is you transition from, you know, EOR to sort of electricity, um, electricity generation, which is an interesting, you know, an interesting transition. And again, if you, again, if you think about, you're looking for, you know, parts of the earth that have already been used, you know, there's a significant land area that's occupied by, uh, by oil fields. Uh, coal bed methane is an interesting idea. The, uh, yes, you could actually drive out more methane by injecting steam. Um, now, whether how effectively you could heat it is another question, but just from the, the thermodynamics of how the methane is there, raising the temperature make, does release a lot of natural gas. Um, so yeah, so there are other alternate places this could play in the fossil fuel, you know, in the fossil fuel space. I think we're don't want to.